Go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Took a little break last week from Mark for Father's Day, but we're back in there this morning. Um, it, just to catch you up to speed, if you remember, if you've been watching online or you've been here the last few weeks, at the end of Mark chapter 4, Jesus calms a storm. The disciples are in the midst of this, he and the disciples are in the midst of this big storm on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus says, peace, be still. And he um, calms that storm, and of course the disciples say, who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. So Jesus showed his authority over the wind and the sea. And then when they, they uh, got to Gerasens, that Jesus, that immediately when he stepped out of the boat, there was a man that came to him that was demon-possessed, and that no one could bind, no one had the strength to subdue him, the text tells us, and that Jesus was able to heal that man, or to, to cast out the demons from that man, and Jesus was able to do what no one else was able to do and showed his authority over the demonic. Well, then chapter 5 continues, and we see Jesus' authority over disease. There was a, a, a lady that had a flow of blood, a discharge for 12 years, and that she knew or she had faith that if she would just be able to touch Jesus' garment, that she would be made well. And so Jesus healed her and showed his authority over disease. And then he healed Jairus' daughter, and so he showed his power and authority over even death. So the wind, the sea, the demonic, disease, and death, Jesus has authority over it all. And in our text this morning, in chapter 6, we see Jesus going to his hometown of Nazareth, and there uh, the people of Nazareth and his own family really uh, rejecting him as the Messiah. So let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went away, or he went about t among the villages, teaching. So Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth. And verse 1 says that his disciples followed him. So when Jesus, when it says that his disciples followed him, what that means is that Jesus was going to Nazareth as a teacher, as a rabbi. He had people that were following him. And so uh, back in the day, if you had disciples, people were following you, they were learning from you. And so uh, Jesus was not just going by himself. He was not just going to see his family, but we would call this uh, not a, a, a pleasure trip or a leisure trip, but a business trip, so to speak. Jesus is on mission. He's got his disciples with him, and he goes to his hometown. Now, Nazareth was a small town. It was only about 150 to 200 people, so even smaller than Strawberry, where I'm from, um, but 150 to 200 people. So the people in the town, they would have known Jesus well. Remember, Jesus started his public ministry about, at about age 30. So he spent 30 years growing up in Nazareth. And if you remember in John chapter 1, verse 46, when Philip goes to tell Nathaniel that they found the Messiah, he says, hey, we have found the Messiah. We have found the one spoken of. In the scriptures, Jesus of Nazareth. Do you remember how Nathaniel responds? He says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Do you all remember that? So there's the, the kind of the idea that people have of Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Uh, can anyone special come from Nazareth? So that was kind of how people viewed the small town of Nazareth. It was just a, a small town that no one, uh, that no one ever came from that, that you knew of. And so that's where Jesus goes. And look at verses 2 and 3. It says, On the Sabbath, 
he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. And they said, or saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hands? Is, this not, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph, or some translations say Joseph, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So the people, they are astonished by Jesus' teaching. It says that those that heard him, they were astonished. They were amazed by his wisdom. What is the wisdom given to him? They can't, the people can see that Jesus, his teachings are astonishing and that he has great wisdom. And they are impressed by the things that he can do. It says, uh, how are such mighty works done by his hands? They've heard and perhaps even seen the things that Jesus can do. These miracles, uh, the healings, the exorcisms. And they've heard the stories about Jesus and they just cannot believe how he can do these things. They've seen the evidence. They heard, they've heard him teach. They've heard his wisdom. They've, they've perhaps seen his miracles or at least heard of them. But yet they say, how can he do this? And notice that they ask five questions in verses 2 and 3. Five questions. Where did this man get these things? Where, what is the wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hands? So they Again, they see his teaching, they see his wisdom, they see his miracles, but then they start asking these personal questions, these biological questions. And they say, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? These questions are meant to disparage and to discredit Jesus. The people are wondering, how can someone with, a, with a, uh, this pedigree, this ordinary pedigree and background, how can he do these things that he is doing? That shouldn't be possible for him to do that. Whenever they say, whenever they mention, um, they say the son of Mary, that's an interesting phrase because typically, how does the Bible phrase uh, when it says the son of? It always says the father, right? I mean, you read the Old Testament, you see these genealogies, or you can go back to Matthew 1, and they all talk about the father, the son of, the son of, the son of. Well, this is the son of Mary. And so commentators have said a couple of things. It's, per, it's possible that at this point, Joseph might have been dead. Or another thing that, that might have been going on is that the crowd was taking a shot at Jesus' birth. You remember Jesus was born of a virgin and the special circumstances. But you know, there were some people that probably thought that Mary had what committed adultery or fornication because if you didn't believe in the virgin birth and you you knew that if you did the math you could tell that she was uh, pregnant and gave birth before or less than nine months than after her and Joseph were wed right and so they may have been taking a shot at him there that hey you're you're just the the son of a woman that was sleeping around that could have been what they were doing here and um but we don't know that for sure. We don't know which one it is. We don't know if Joseph was simply dead or if they were taking a, a little shot at Jesus in that way. And they say, uh, you know, his four brothers are here. Uh, his sisters are here. In other words, how can really, th there's no way that this man can be the Messiah. We know his family. We've known him for 30 years. Um, there's no way that Jesus can be who people are saying that he is. They cannot reconcile what Jesus has done and who they think that he is. In verse uh, 3 at the end, it says that they took offense at him. The, the Greek word there is the word where we get the word scandal. In other words, they thought it was a scandal that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. They, were, they thought it was a scandal and they took offense at him. They thought, there's no way. There's no way that this guy we grew up with in this small town, we all know him, uh, I should have had that song. That I'm just a small town boy, right? That, that just came to mind. Uh, all these songs roll through my head somehow whenever I'm preaching. But just a small town boy. There's no way that this is the Messiah. And Jesus, notice how he responds in verse 4. It says, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Jesus, what he's saying here is that if someone was not from Nazareth and had come to Nazareth and, and spoke the things that he had spoken of 
and knew the things that he knew and did the things that he did, then he, that person would have been held in high honor. But because they knew Jesus and they knew his upbringing and his background, they took offense at him and they did not hold him in honor. The people marveled at Jesus' words and works, but they refused to accept the claims that Jesus made. Look at, turn over with me real fast to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, uh, Luke gives a little bit more detail to this account, and so that kind of helps us to understand what kind of claims was Jesus actually making. Because they, the, the claims that, he, that they rejected... So Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21 says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus reads that scripture from Isaiah and he says, today this has been fulfilled. You're looking, at the, you're looking at the person that this text describes. And that was the claims that they couldn't, they couldn't handle it. They, they were scandalized, so to speak. They took offense at him. They said, there's no way that that is Jesus. And so therefore, Jesus says that a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. These, these people's hearts, they were hardened. Remember, Jesus' family thought he was crazy. Go back to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. You remember this? It says that he, then he went home and the, uh, and the crowd gathered again. And this is Jesus in Capernaum. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. Jesus' family had heard about the miracles that he was doing and the claims that he was making, and they had gone from Nazareth to Capernaum to go get him. He was bringing, they thought, he is out, Jesus is out, and he's talking crazy. And so you can imagine, uh, you know, everybody has that, you know, it's kind of a proverbial crazy uncle, you know. But everybody's got somebody in their family that you just wish wouldn't go out in public very much. Because you know they're going to say something that you're just like, man, I wish you wouldn't say that, you know. Uh, I don't know if you have this person in your family, but Jesus was that person in his family. They thought, he is crazy. He's bringing, uh, the, the Pharisees are coming from Jerusalem. They're saying he's demon-possessed. He's definitely crazy. And so they had gone to get him. And so you can imagine that if Jesus' own family to this point has rejected him, that the people of Nazareth are like, that small town boy, has, he's lost it. But what was the problem with the people of Nazareth? Why did they not trust him as others had? Jesus was going all over uh, Galilee. He was going all over uh, around the Sea of Galilee and other places. And other people, of course, some of them rejected him, but some people didn't. But what was different about the people of Nazareth? And I think it's that they, re- they thought that they really knew him. These people had known Jesus for 30 years, and they thought they knew everything about him. And for those of us who've been around Christian in the church or around Christianity for a long time, this is a danger we can have, right? That we uh, should never get comfortable with Jesus. Jesus' goal is not to make us comfortable, is it? But his goal is to bring us to repentance and faith, and that we take up our crosses and follow him with our lives. Uh, I, can't, uh, I thought about this illustration of vaccines, um, vaccines and inoculation. So a vaccine, the way it works is that um, the, whatever that you're try- the, the uh, medical folks are trying to help you guard against, for instance, the flu, they give you a little bit of the flu or that disease or the virus, right? Whatever you're, they're trying to guard against. And the hope 
is that your body will be able to fight that off and then produce the antibodies that you need to be able to fight off the, the disease if you get the full-fledged version, right? Well, sometimes that can happen with us. We can, um, people that grew up in church, or we can hear, we can, we've heard so much of the truth of the gospel and the, the Bible that sometimes we can become inoculated and that sometimes we're not open. We have just enough of the truth to where that we're not open to some of the harder claims that Jesus makes. And we're like, well, no, this is how, this is what the gospel is, and this is how, what Christianity is, because this is what I've always experienced. And that's what these people, they, knew who, they thought they knew who Jesus was. And so they, they rejected him. And so I think that can happen. We can become inoculated. Uh, have we been in church for so long that Jesus' words no longer convict or challenge us? Challenge us. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I've read through my Bible more than once. And sometimes when you read something for the first time, you're like, whoa, I can't believe Jesus said that. But now you get to the Bible, and I, I, I mean, I do this. I get to a section, and even though if it's a really hard section, I'm like, well, I know what Jesus is going to say here. And it's easy to just tone it down and say, well, I've heard that before, when you read a really hard passage of Scripture. Have we become so familiar with Jesus and the words of Scripture that they no longer pierce our hearts? Do we read our Bibles? Do we listen to the sermons? Do we read, when we read the Bible or hear a sermon, are we cut by the Bible's words, or do we think, boy, I wish someone, I wish so-and-so was here so they could have heard that, you know, that, that it's not for us, that it's for that, it's for, it's for, oh, so-and-so that's not here. I wish they would have been here. Um, I, I know y'all have never done that, but, but that happens to me. I'm like, well, I don't struggle with that, but I really wish, oh, you know, Billy Bob was here and he could have heard that. He really needed that about the, uh, you know, anyway, whatever the issue is, but are we, are we so familiar that we sometimes reject Jesus' words? Notice how Jesus responds at the end of the text in verses 5 and 6. It says, And he, could not, he couldn't do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. So Jesus, in verse 5, it says that he could do no mighty work there. But, but really, Jesus would not do any work there. He would not perform miracles in the face of blatant unbelief. Jesus, he did not do miracles just because he wanted to do miracles. Uh, these, mir G these miracles in this area would have not done a lot of good. Jesus wanted people to accept his message. Remember, that's why he really came. He came to preach the gospel. That's Mark 1.15. Uh, Mark 1.15 says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That was the message that Jesus proclaimed. And his miracles, they were just there to show people that he truly was the Son of God. Yes, he cared about people. He, he was concerned for them. He loved them. But he wanted... Yes, he wanted to heal them, but he wanted, furthermore, to heal them spiritually and for them to come to saving faith. Jesus wanted people to put their faith and their trust in him, not just to come for healing. You remember, um, we'll get there, I think, uh, in a couple weeks, where we talk about Jesus feeding the 5,000. There were a lot of people that liked Jesus' bread and his provision, but whenever Jesus started teaching, they were, I don't want to hear that, Jesus. Just give me the bread and the miracles. Um, but look at Mark chapter 5, verse 34 from a couple weeks ago about faith. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The lady that had this discharge for 12 years, Jesus said that it was your faith that made you well. She had put her faith in Jesus, and Jesus made her well. And then verse 36 of chapter 5. He told uh, Jairus, he said, do not fear, only believe. Jesus is teaching Jairus and his family and this lady that they need to have faith in him. This morning, I want to tell us something and remind us something that unbelief and lack of faith robs the church of its power. We can have events and programs and we can fill our calendar but without a believing expectancy in Jesus and his power, then nothing will come of it. 
Hebrews 11.6 says this, And without faith it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Do you believe that Jesus can save your wayward child? Do you believe that Jesus can save your neighbor that hates God? Do you believe that our church can grow in maturity and in number, that we can grow as a church? Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith it's impossible to please Him. At Nazareth, many people rejected Jesus, and, that, and therefore He would not do mighty works there. It says that, what did He do? He says, except that He laid His hands on a few sick people and healed them. See, Jesus, it's not that Jesus couldn't do it, that He physically couldn't do it. It's that he refused to because people didn't put their faith and their trust in him. They didn't believe in the words that he spoke. And it says he marveled at their unbelief. This morning, I hope that we will not be a church that Jesus would marvel at our unbelief, but that he would marvel at our trust and our faith and our hope that we put in him and that we trust him and that he's good and that he can do the things that he has promised that he will do. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church. Do we believe that he would do that for us this morning? This morning I want us to see that familiarity with Jesus can blind us from seeing him for who he truly is. Familiarity with Jesus can blind us from seeing him for he truly is. But Jesus is the perfect son of God. He was born of a virgin and he came and he lived a perfect life. He obeyed God's law perfectly and he died on the cross for our sins in our place. And he calls us to turn from our sins and put our trust in him. That we can't have eternal life any other way except that we put our whole trust in Jesus. And that he's promised to save us if we do that and we commit our lives to him. Well, that's the word this morning. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to have you stand. We're going to have a, a, a short time of invitation. Then we'll proceed into the Lord's Supper. So.